So one thing I never truly understood growing up was what it meant to be undocumented. For the longest time, I thought I was an American. I mean, I've lived in Oregon. When I lived in Utah in 2001, I remember the 2000 Olympics were held in Salt Lake City, and I saw the Greek flame pass by my apartment building. I've lived in California for the last 10 years. But over time, there's little lessons you learn along the way, little tidbits that teach you exactly what it means to be undocumented. Like at 16, when all of my friends were obtaining driver's licenses, and driving cars, and I still had to take the bus to school, or whenever we would go to the theaters, I would have to slip in my report card to the, to the teller just to confirm how old I was. In 2005, the greatest lesson was learned. When a phone call arrived to, arrived to my house at midnight, and this phone call, those kind of phone calls you never want to receive. My dad picked up the phone, looked over at me and said, your sister passed away. So automatically I told him like, hey, let's hop on a plane. We got to be there at that funeral. And he told me, we're not going to go. What do you mean we're not going to go? We have to. It's my sister. It's your daughter. And he simply told me, well, son, we could go. But if we do, we're never coming back. So similar to Alvaro, I am from Mexico. I was born in Mexico, but I was brought over at nine months, and I was raised in Boyle Heights in East LA. And so I also didn't know what it meant to be undocumented. I still don't really know what it means to be undocumented. I only know my experiences and what I've learned from them. Something that really impacted me was when I was, it was the summer of my 13th birthday, and my parents and I, we decided to go to Las Vegas for the first time. It was a weird family trip, but it was a family trip nonetheless. <laughs> and so when we were getting to our hotel parking lot, um, we were getting our luggage out, and then there was a car that drove right past us. As they were driving, they yelled something. They screamed, go back to Mexico, you filthy wetbacks. That memory still triggers me because it was the first time I felt dehumanized by my status being thrown in my face. So. Now we need to acknowledge that we cannot communicate the experiences of every undocumented person in the country. We can only communicate our own stories. And even then it's been a very daunting experience just trying to come up to what to say today. But to better understand the narratives that we'll continue to be telling today, let's go back to the day of June 15, 2012 when Barack Obama instituted a piece of legislation that would change the lives of undocumented youth forever. This legislation, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, allowed undocumented youth to apply and obtain three things, a driver's license, a social security number, and a worker's permit. Now these are all very mundane things that many people just expect, they're stepping stones. But for us, it was a moment that radically changed the way we lived our lives. I was 15 when I started to work at a flower shop in downtown LA with my mom to make ends meet. And as a 15 year old, I didn't want to get up at six in the morning and work until like 8 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. Like, no, kids want, you know, that to play around and stuff. But anyway, um, as, I was, as I was throwing away filthy water from the flowers and other plants that we saw there, I realized that I wanted to do something more than just that for the rest of my life. I wanted to make my parents proud. So when DACA was announced, I was hopeful, but I was also taken aback a bit because it was scary. I talked to my parents, they said, have hope. And so we, did, we took that leap of faith and I applied. Fortunately, my parents had the money to apply. It was $465. Others don't have that privilege. So I applied, I took the leap of hope, and now I'm here. I thankfully have the experience of being a college student thus far. Not only that, I work at the Dream Center, and that has helped me find my passion in, with working with underrepresented communities. Now, when I found out about DACA, I had already graduated high school. Um, I was actually on my way to school, Pierce College, for those of you that know the area. 
And since I couldn't drive, I would ride a bike to school. And as I'm riding, I remember listening to my iPod Nano. And I had a built-in radio, so I was listening to La Que Buena, just because sometimes corridos are the only way to keep moving. And curious thing about this radio station is oftentimes they inform the community of listeners with legislation and measures that will affect their, their listener base. That was the first time I heard about DACA. And I had to get off the bike lane and onto the sidewalk just to think to myself, is this too good to be true? So that day I called my parents, and when I went home we discussed it. And to my dismay they said, seems like a hoax, son. But then they thought for a second, and then they told me something that their parents told them their entire lives. La vida es de los arriesgados. Life belongs to the risk takers. When my parents moved to this country, they didn't come here for the promise of a better life. They came in the pursuit of one, not knowing how it would ultimately turn up. So with their motivation, I'm now at CSUN, an institution I never thought would be an opportunity available to myself. I can drive now, and I ride my bike less, which probably isn't a good thing altogether. <laughs> but all in all, my life has changed for the better. And just because my parents taught me that risks are worth it, that's the only way to live life. So, I identify as undocumented and afraid. I believe that being undocumented here in the United States and being, and being fearful go hand in hand. Why? Because one, I fear that all my years in college, all my years in school, all my parents' sacrifices, all my sacrifices will be in vain after college if I can't get a job or if they don't take me serious because I, I'm a DACA recipient or what, whatever. And then second, I'm afraid of deportation, being relocated from my home. And finally, I'm also afraid of even standing here in front of you. Because communicating this story is not easy. I've never been asked to share my story before. I've been taught my whole life to hide in the shadows and assimilate. <sighs> now you may be asking yourselves, well, you have a social security number now. You can drive, you can go to work. What are you still afraid of? Well, DACA we have to apply for every two years. So that uncertainty, that anxiety that characterized our, characterized our lives prior to DACA never went away. It just comes back every two years. Now the day Barack Obama instituted this legislation, and I quote, this is not amnesty. This is not a path to citizenship. This is a temporary fix. And temporary fixes only usher temporary results. Now, as Mr. White said, whenever you're about, or about to batter down a barrier, let's show some authentic respect. And we've communicated some of the benefits that we've lived through ever from Stockton. But I haven't communicated the most important one yet. So when I came to this country, I was three years old. On Tuesday, I'll turn 23. And thanks to a study abroad program designed exclusively for undocumented students with DACA, I was able to go home and return to Mexico in winter. Now, Mexico was a place that I had only learned through songs and narratives and generally music and every other source except personal experience. I was able to find out exactly why los tacos al pastor in Mexico are dangerous. <laughs> I was actually able to visit my grandmother's home and be a visitor in her house, opposed to when she comes over. But most importantly, I was able to do something I should have done a very long time ago. I was able to visit the grave of my sister and every other family member I couldn't attend to. Now, I'm not special. I'm one of millions. And while my story is being heard today, there are thousands of others that are left unheard, and still even more who have not been able to benefit from DACA. And everybody here understands that we all deserve to feel human. We all deserve to be 
complete in one way or another. And my trip to Mexico gave me that sense of completion, gave me that sense of humanness. And as an undocumented person, that's something you don't often feel. I want to experience what Alvaro experienced. I want to go back to Mexico and meet all those family members that were left behind from when I was nine months old. And also pay my respects to everybody I didn't get to meet. Like Alvaro said, we're not special. This should not be unique to us. Everybody deserves to feel like they matter, like they're human. <clears throat> Sorry. Now we're here with a sense of urgency today because come November, depending on which administration enters the White House, either one of two things will happen to DACA. It will either be extended and better to usher in a more permanent solution or it will be eradicated and the lives we once knew as undocumented people will once again become a reality. So all we're asking you today is to consider the lives that are affected by policies like DACA, how the human experience of these people are bettered, all from a signature. Because at the end of the day, undocumented or not, we all deserve to feel human, and we all deserve to feel complete. Thank you.